All right, we're on uh, Revelation 13 now, page 1, the beast. And Revelation 13, 1, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. And his mouth was uh, like a lion's mouth. So again, he's seeing a vision here. A beast, this is often referred to as the Antichrist. You've all heard that term. And um, I believe it's the case, but I don't think the word Antichrist is even in the book of Revelation. If that's this, if that, somebody maybe has a concordance, they can look that up, but I believe it's the case. And yet, uh, you know, we often spend a lot of time talking about him, but the term Antichrist is never really there, I think. Who, somebody confirm that for me. <laughs> but anyhow, the word Antichrist is used in the Bible in various places. Let's read about what it says. 1 John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now... Many antichrists have come. So here he talks about many, not just not one, not the ultimate one, but many. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, this was written uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, or a little over 2,000 years ago now, or right around 2,000 years ago, I suppose. And he's saying that uh, we know it's the last hour. I think that... Um, the last days actually began here, you know, in the, on the day of Pentecost when they got up and the people were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues and Peter got up and began to describe what was happening. He, he, prof he said, this is a prophecy from Joel and it says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so to me, the last days began there, even though it's lasted over, a, you know, nearly a 2,000 year period. It's been in play for some time now. And I think it's because of uh, what we've, we've spoken about with the whole Daniel 70 week prophecy, the, the crucifixion of Christ being like the central theme of all history. And then now we're living in this time of the Gentiles until the end. These are the last days. Now, obviously, every day we live, we're one closer to that great day, the, the great day of the Lord, but we're we're living in the last days and have been for some time. And so John writes here, uh, we know that it's the last hour. So the bullet points here, there are many, not just one Antichrist. They have been here since the days that John wrote 1 John. Not, not just at the end of, the, not just at the, end of the, the age here. It is a sign of the last hour. And I just already spent some time mentioning this here. The last days have been here since the start of the church. Antichrist is anyone who denies the Father and the Son. So 1 John 2.22 says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. So in, in one sense, anybody that's in the world today that denies Jesus Christ is Antichrist. There's an Antichrist spirit, you know, or nat the nature of that person. He is against Christ. He doesn't want anything to do with Christ. That's what Antichrist means. I'm against Christ. So there are plenty of people that would fall in this category even today. When we speak about an Antichrist nation, it's a nation of people whose maybe their philosophy or the religions they espouse are against Christ. They're against the Father. Those are antichrist by nature. And then it says, uh, the spirit of the antichrist does not confess that Jesus is from God. So 1 John 4, 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist. So again, you have people that might be out here, even in our country, who have embraced secular philosophy as their religion or no religion or agnosticism or any, any of those kind of things is really they're walking in this, this spirit of Antichrist. You know, it's against God. This is the spirit of, of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now 
is already in the world. You know, so I'm not waiting for the Antichrist. That spirit is already here. And it's been here, moving and active in the world for some time. And Antichrist will not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. You know why? Because that, again, is the whole basis of our salvation. Jesus came in the flesh, so it is God who became a man who died for, man, died for all mankind. It's, it's the perfect hu human. He's 100% God, 100% man, never sinned. Any other person who had sin in his life could never die for any because he would die only for his own sin. But Jesus lived that perfect life. And so if you can deny that he came in the flesh, if you can deny that he even existed, that would be right in line with Satan's tactic to push against God. That's Antichrist. So they want to deny that Christ has come in the flesh. In 2 John 1, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So I guess I want you to see that when you talk about the Antichrist, it's more than just that beast at the end of the age. It's, it's a pervasive spirit that has worked within this world for some time. And maybe even people that you go to school with or people you work with, or maybe you yourself at one time walked in the spirit of the Antichrist. You know, who knows? I don't know what you, your belief system was before you came to Jesus. But there's probably people in, live in your neighborhood, that work on your job that you know and interact with on a regular basis that are of this spirit of Antichrist. Now, does that mean we run away from them? No, because we have power over all the power of the enemy. And we're to love them and we're to share the gospel. And we're hopefully able to shed the light of the gospel upon them so they can see it and turn and say, yes, Jesus is come in the flesh. Jesus is the Son of God. And they can remove themselves from that spirit of Antichrist to the spirit of God. It, I just looked it up in Google when it says Antichrist is only mentioned here. That's the only place, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, isn't that weird, though? Yeah, w w Wikipedia, you got to believe everything that's on there. No. <laughs> but you know, uh, I guess my point of that is a lot of times when you talk to people, they just make a big deal of the Antichrist, but not realizing it's a very pervasive. It's not just that man. And um, you are living in a world that, that's permeated with the spirit of the Antichrist. And uh, we're still alive, right? We're still breathing and everything's, everything's okay. I mean, even though that spirit has been working for some time. Now, will it get worse? I think. I mean, the Bible tells, tells us here at the end, Satan's going to really rise up with great vehemence. But, but just know that that thing has been around so it says it's rising out of the sea. This beast is rising out of the sea. And as we've discussed many times already, waters and sea represent mankind. So basically, this beast is a man. He's coming out of man. He's not anything supernatural. He's, he's a man, just like you and I. The angel said, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples. Okay, the beast resembles the dragon of chapter 12. The main difference is the number and placement of the crowns. So the dragon, Revelation 12 said, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. This beast, there were ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on his horns. So a little bit different, but similar description. It says, he was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear, its mouth was like a lion's mouth. This is very much like the description of the various beasts in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 7, verse uh, 3 through 6, it says, there were four great beasts, each different from the others, and they came up out of the sea. Again, the same idea, coming out of man, coming out of the sea. The first was like a lion, it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human being was, uh, mind of a human was given to it. it was, there was before me a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. 
It was told, Get up and eat uh, your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there was before me another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. So in Daniel, these beasts uh, represented nations. Uh, these are really historical events already. Uh, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, different nations that have risen up to have kind of like a world dominance in, in historic times. This beast we described here seems like it's an aggregate of all these animals. You know, it had, what did it say? It had a, uh, it was like a leopard, feet of a bear, mouth like a lion. So kind of a combination of these things. <clears throat> so I just put down here, maybe it's describing a combination or an aggregate of all that is evil in all these various nations through history. You know what I mean? Parts of this, parts of that, all combined into one really evil one. The authority of the beast. It says here, and, and to it, to this beast, the dragon gave his power and his throne. Now, who is the dragon? That's, we know that was Satan, right? We've already seen that. So, this, so Satan gave his power and his throne and great authority to the beast. So even though he came out of man, he, he was given authority from Satan. Now, whose authority have you been given? Jesus' authority. So who's greater? Right. You know, I just want you to put this in perspective. Even though he may have the power and the throne and the authority of Satan, you have the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even little Q, Susie Q, a five-year-old Susie Q, has greater power and authority than the Antichrist. And so we, we, we paint this picture of him as this one who just is going to ruin my life. I wish there was never an Antichrist, but you just got to understand you have greater authority. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it says here, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they, listen to this, they worshipped the dragon. Remember I was telling you in the earlier chapter that one of the motivations of Satan was to be worshipped. He's ultimately going to get that through the Antichrist. So there were people who were following the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So, points here, his authority came from Satan, and at the sign of a miracle, the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, I'm saying that because, you know, I believe in signs and wonders, and I believe in miracles. I believe that God is a God of miracles, and he still does miracles today. But Satan also does signs and lying wonders. And if all you are about is looking for signs and wonders, you could possibly be deceived by this event. It talks about this beast having a mortal wound and then a healing taking place. And all of a sudden, the whole world is marveling, like, wow, look what just happened. This must be of God. There was this mortal wound, and yet he's alive. And if all we, if all we are as people is captivated by a sign or a wonder, we put ourselves on a, a potential edge of being able to be deceived by something even like this. So Jesus said in Matthew 16, an evil an adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Does that mean we don't believe in signs? No, we believe in signs. And, and we want signs to follow those who believe. But it, it, it's also true that an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. How many, how many people have you ever talked to that said, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just see a miracle, I'd believe. I could, if I could just see this happen, if, if God would just heal this person, if God would, he, somehow if he could just prove himself to me, well, one day the whole world's going to see this, and the whole world will marvel, and it will cause a deception to come, and say, hey, i got to follow this guy. Who can do it like this? No one is like this. And they begin to worship him. And so, 
It says, um, Jesus said, no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And there he was talking about his resurrection. The sign that we need to be concerned about is that Jesus rose from the dead in three days. That's the sign. That is the sign. And everything else happens because of that sign. He's still alive. He still can heal. He still can raise from the dead. But that is the sign. That's the one I looked for and you looked for. We believed, we confessed with the Lord Jesus, and we believed that God raised him from the dead. That's the sign. And so in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, When the lawless one is revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. See, there again we find that his authority is coming from Satan. But Jesus will kill him when he returns. This lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all what? Power, with false signs, and wonders. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. So, I make a, bigger, I make a big deal about the truth. Because the truth is what will preserve his people in the end. The testimony of Jesus Christ. And other people may, might make a bigger deal out of signs and wonders. That's their prerogative. I think they're both important. But we can never separate truth from the things that God is doing with signs and, signs and wonders. Because we find here that even Satan, in the end, this activity of Satan will be with power, signs, and wonders. You see it even in the book of Acts. Simon the sorcerer, he had deceived the people with his miracles and all the things that he did until, until the power of God came, and then even Simon himself saw those miracles and he believed. So there, there's, there, there have been signs and wonders that are satanic in nature, probably all through church history but maybe an increase of that in these days. But the danger, or the, I guess the sad thing that I see in this, is the whole world marveled. We should be able to sit there and see a sign and a lying wonder and say, hey, that's, that one there is not of God. Or something, something's not right about this one. You know, there are, there's a book I read, uh, an article I read from a, a man who had gone over to, uh, I think it was the Philippines, and they had these people over there that, uh, and I think this is even documented. I mean, there was pictures and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm not, I, it sounds weird what I'm going to say to you, but you have to look it up yourself. I'm not going to sit here and vouch for it. But they would, they would have these guys who could have an operation. They would lay you on the table, and maybe you had a stomach pain. They would actually come over here and stick their hand inside a person's stomach and pull out a tumor right there in front, right there in front of people. And uh, of course, you know, people were flocking to see all this kind of stuff. And um, problem is, is they're not preaching truth. They're preaching something other than Jesus Christ. Now, if you came across something like that, where would you stand? Would you say, we have to follow these guys because look at the signs and wonders? Or would you say, I still have to stand with the truth of Jesus Christ? I hope you would say, I will stand with the truth of Jesus Christ. So just be discerning. That's all I'm saying. When Jesus says here, or, jo or Paul writes, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to kill this Antichrist. And those people who were deceived by him were those who did not love the truth. They refused to believe the truth and be saved. They instead marveled at this sign and this wonder, and they worshipped the beast. So now... In uh, the next point there, the whole earth worshiped the dragon. Satan desires worship. And I, and I mentioned this, I won't read it now, in the last chapter, Ezekiel 28, that he was at the, the very throne of God. I like the way that King James puts it, and in, in, I'll read that part of it there in the, in the dark uh, bold. It says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that you were created. In other words, it almost kind of gives this idea that, that worship or music was created in Satan. You know, and you find, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of music today is probably, what's the word I want? Uh, neutral. It's not, 
I mean, what is it? You say, I want to listen to Christian music. What does that mean? The music's saved? Or is it about God? You know, that's what we mean, right? But there's probably other songs that aren't necessarily written by Christian authors that aren't satanic in nature, like, you know, Rocky Mountain High. Maybe that is satanic. I don't know. <laughs> Almost Heaven, West Virginia. Maybe that's a good one. You know what I'm saying? But then there's other ones that are, I'm sure they're exalting Satan, you know. And just listen to them. But the point of it is, is that music drives and it attracts and it draws upon people. And I think Satan knows that. I mean, at the throne of God, he sees these millions and millions of angels falling and worshiping and all the power that's there. And he has music and tabrets and pipes and he has wisdom and he has beauty. The difference between Satan and Jesus, Jesus had no beauty. He says he was not beautiful that we would desire him. Satan had this beauty. And he's exalting himself, saying, I want to be better than him. I want to lift myself up above the throne. But he had this music here. And when he, in, Ma, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he asked Jesus to worship him. Isn't that an odd, an odd thing to say? Out of all the things he could tempt Jesus with, he said, just fall down and worship me. In Matthew 4, 9, he says, all these I will give you. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It's all I want. I'll give you the world. I'll give you all the kingdoms. You don't have to go to the cross. Just fall down and worship me. It's all I want. You know, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Lord, that Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Amen? And now, in the Antichrist, worship will finally come to him. 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, 2, verse 3, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes. The man of lawlessness is revealed, son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. See, he's against anything else that's worshipped. He wants worship to come to him. To me, I think that's even one of the things, when, when you think about the mark of the beast, which will come out later on, later, you know, later on, where people cannot buy or sell or do anything unless you take this, because everything that man worships out here, which could be money, fame, food, houses, car, any of that stuff that we worship, you know, we lay God aside and we worship everything else, he's going to say, you can't have any of this unless you come to me. See, he, he exalts himself above anything that's worshipped. He wants everything to come to him. Worship me. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Ultimately, his desire will be fulfilled in the beast. And so, Revelation 13, it says, It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. This is the beast and uh, goes in line with what we read earlier in chapter 12 there. He will uh, make war on the saints and conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. See, it's about worship. All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written in the found, in, in, before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So the world's going to fall into one of two categories. Those who worship the beast and those whose names are written in the book of life. It's, he's taking everything and saying, bring everything to worship the beast. Everything to worship the beast. And those who stand for Christ who have the testimony of Jesus, uh, those who are written in the book of life are separated from that. Everybody else called to worship him. Revelation 13, 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. He makes them. It's all about worship. Whose mortal wound was healed. Revelation 13, 15, it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those 
who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And there again, it's about worship. Revelation 14, 9, another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. So I, I hope you can see from these scriptures here that it, it's going to boil down to, in the end, who we worship. That's really all, all it's about. We are called as people to worship the Lord our God and to serve him only. Satan, his downfall was because he wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to exalt himself up above even the throne of God. He was cast down and he was cast down and he was cast down. And he's coming against these people who are coming forth. I mean, who are we? We are people who have come to know Jesus and out of our own free will, we stand here and we worship him. That, to me, is another reason why worship is such a powerful part of the Christian life. That we stand, no one's making us do it. No one's saying, I'm going to hold a gun to your head unless you worship Jesus. We come here and we fall on our face and we weep before him and we, you know, we open our hearts. And we say, Lord, change my life. And we're saying, I'm worshiping you. Out of our own free will. People who have been taken from the power of darkness, who were once following the prince of the power of the air, we've said, I want nothing to do with that kingdom. I'm coming over here, and the, and the heart of my worship is being turned to the only one who deserves it. Worship the Lord your God and him only. And so I encourage you, as men and women of God, be a worshiper. Don't, don't just come and sit on your hands and, and, or, or just you know, watch what's happening. Say, God, let my heart be turned to you. Let, let my heart be on fire for you. you know, in, in, if you can use that term. Let my heart be on fire for you because I don't want to worship anything else. I don't want to worship myself. I don't want to worship my job, my car, my house, my wife, my children, anything. I want to worship you alone because in the end, I think you can see here, everybody in the world is going to be pushed to worship this beast. But I don't want to be among that number. And neither do you. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed to exercise authority 42 months. There's that same three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints. And there's that statement again. He, he was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. What does that mean? Well, here's what something Jesus said. Don't be afraid of him who can kill your body. Didn't he say that? He said, be afraid rather of him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Even though he may conquer them, he hasn't really conquered us. There's a place here, I think we'll read it even here, maybe it's the next chapter, where Jesus says, if you die, I'm going to give you a crown of life. And so, he will make war on the saints and conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And so we see, I just drew a little comparison there between the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13. I think you can see it's probably speaking about the same uh, individual there speaking words against the Most High, making war with the saints and prevailing in, be, in the three and a half year period. So, next page, verse 8, says, All who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. And there, again, it just shows us, ladies and gentlemen, how the most critical thing we can do as a church is to help people get their name in the book of life. Come over here and follow Jesus. Because your future, if it's not that, is to worship the beast. And the Lord says, anybody who worships the beast or his image will also drink of the wrath of God. The world is defined by two groups, those who worship the beast and those whose names are written in the book of life. 
If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. And then he says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. I, you know, I, I, when I read this verse, it's, it just seems to me to say, don't worry about it. You know, if you're called to be a martyr, guess what? <laughs> you're going to be a martyr. You know what I mean? <laughs> but if you are, he'll be there. And so he says, if you have an ear, here. If you're to be taken captive, well, to captivity you go. How many of you know that down through church history, probably hundreds of thousands of Christians have been taken into captivity? And down through church history, I don't know how many, but thousands upon thousands of Christians have been slain with the sword. And Jesus says, if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. But it's not the end. That is not the end of you. And then he says this word. Here is a call for endurance and for faith. So don't give up. Don't let fear drive you away. Don't let fear move you from this faith and endurance in Jesus Christ. Don't let fear push you to the side where you say, I think I'm, I'm going to go ahead and worship the beast because I feel like I want to have some groceries tomorrow. You know, somehow you've got to be able to stand and have faith during that time. So there's a call that goes out saying, hey, this might happen, but just hang in there. Just endure in the Lord. As the beast makes war on the saints and conquers them, we are told by the Lord to have endurance and faith. It is a similar message he spoke to a number of the churches. And here's this, uh, if you go back to, again to the Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you'll see the various churches he spoke very similar. This, is, this calls for the patient endurance on the part of the saints. And remember in Revelation 6, he told the martyrs who were there, there are others who must die as well. Remember that? And I won't read that, but... There's the scripture there for you. Jesus said, don't fear him who can take your life. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. Why was he telling his disciples that? Because many of them were going to die. And he was preparing them. He wasn't trying to bring fear into their life. He was saying, listen, don't be afraid of this. We are bringing a message. You guys are going to be on the front lines of taking this good news of the kingdom to this world, apart from which everybody is going to perish. And so if some of you have to die, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to give my life. And if some of you have to die, don't be afraid. That's what he's saying to them. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, they have nothing more they can do. You know, once that body's laying there, that's it. Nothing more they can do. But, you know, after that body's dead, there's a lot more the Lord can do. And so he says... I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. And yes, I tell you to fear him. So the Lord just puts all this into perspective for us, doesn't he? He wants us to have a peace and a faith and an endurance, not to fear what the future might hold, but to know that we are in a battle and that we are really out here trying to reach the souls of men for eternity. And we're not, we're not to live our lives in fear for the things that might come upon the earth. Jesus will give you the crown of life. That's the scripture I was talking about. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. That's what he tells this church. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for 10 days. You will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Now, come on, Jesus. What are you trying to say to us here? He says, be faithful. Endure, be faithful even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently. Revelation 2, 19, I know your works, your love, your faith, and service, and patient endurance. Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. So that word is used over and over and over by Jesus Christ to the church. 
And it has to do with facing the trials that come into our life. Look into the future and knowing you can have patient endurance in the midst. So then there's another beast mentioned. Verse 11, then I saw another beast arising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. It spoke like, like a dragon. It had horns like a lamb, like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. There, there's that worship again, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, this second beast. Even making fire come down from heaven. That's got to be a, 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 a Christian prophet, right? I mean, who else can make fire come down from heaven? Well, apparently this beast can. He will make fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. It won't be a story you heard about or something you read on the Internet. He'll do it right in front of people. And by the signs that, that it's allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. By what? The signs telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And so I wrote down here, perhaps a religious leader. Some call this beast the false prophet. He had horns like a lamb, but Jesus is the true lamb. He spoke like a dragon. The dragon is Satan. He's a liar from the beginning, and this guy can't do anything but lie, in my opinion. He makes the earth worship the beast. We're told to worship and serve only the Lord. He performs great signs by which he deceives those who dwell on the earth. And when the Lord performs great signs, it's to bring glory to Jesus. It's to bless and build the lives of other people, but bring, ultimately bring glory to Jesus Christ. And he's told to make an image. And the Bible prohibits that in the Ten Commandments. So it seems like this is a religious leader of sorts. And again, when you hear uh, the, the way of our world today, which is people are becoming agnostic or they just don't believe anything they don't want to believe in christianity they'll believe in almost anything they just don't want to believe in historic christianity they're setting themselves up for something like this so it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain it also causes both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So the image of the beast came to life. It can speak. It can kill. It can cause people to be marked on the right hand or forehead by requiring this before a person could buy or sell. The mark is his name or the number of his name. And it says in verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. In the book of Revelation, there's much to be said about the name, about the name being written on people. So I'm going to talk about this name, this mark of this name. And all these scriptures here, uh, you see all through the book of Revelation, about a name and the writing of a name. Sometimes it's the Lord, sometimes it's the Antichrist. But it talks about, in Revelation 11, those who fear your name. Revelation 13, they utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name. You know, the name of God is a very, very important. It is his nature, its character. The name of God is written on the one who overcomes in Revelation 3.12. His name is written there. That's the name I want written on me. How about you? The name of Jesus Christ. We cannot buy or sell without the name of the beast in Revelation 13, 17. In Revelation 14, 1, 144,000 had the Father's name written on their forehead. In Revelation 14, 11, the judgment of those who would receive the mark of the beast's name is that they would go to the uh, lake of fire. Uh, these are those who have conquered the beast and the number of his name, those who stand with the Lord. Some, some of those were martyred, and they, they uh, stood against the beast and the number of his name. Revelation 15, 4, may we always glorify your name. And then Revelation 22, 3, no longer will there be anything accursed. This is at the very end, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His servants will worship him. They will see his face 
and his name will be on their foreheads. So there's a great battle that we've seen it all through the Bible, all through history, and even in this, these last couple of chapters of Revelation, this great spiritual battle between who is to be worshipped, whose name is written upon you, who has victory in the end. You know, and it's, this battle is between the beast, the Lord, and his people. The beast is given authority by the dragon. He attempts to assert himself into the lives of everyone, to blaspheme the Lord, and to draw worship unto himself. And this is just me. Perhaps the 666, what he says is the number of man, is simply a reminder to us that the beast is only a man. It's only a man. He is not the Lord of glory. That no matter what signs or miracles he performs or what demands he makes, he is only a man who is himself ultimately subject to the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just an opinion. You know, we make so much of the Antichrist, but he's just a man. And the little Susie Q has more authority in the name of Jesus than the Antichrist. You just have to decide whose name you want written on your forehead. I want Jesus. You got to decide who you want to worship. You got to decide where you stand. You got to decide if you're going to be willing to endure and have patient endurance, even if trials come. Maybe sometimes the trials we experience now that we get all bent out of shape about, like I got a flat tire, my washing machine broke, or whatever it is, maybe those are just preparing us a little bit for someone to walk up and say, worship that image over there, I'm going to kill you. And you can say, go for it, because Jesus is going to give me the crown of life. You know, all you can do is kill me after that, and nothing more you can do. <laughs> so anyhow, I don't want to make light of it. But I, I'm trying to help you put it in the perspective of of how the Word of God presents this, you know. I think there's a lot of people that are very, very afraid when they think of the last days. They think of things they hear, things they read, things that they've seen in a movie, and they're like, I, I don't want to even talk about it. I don't want to think about it, you know. But, but you see, yeah, there, there's trouble sometimes, and there are things that he will do. He will overpower these saints here. It says it here. But... In the end, we win. In the end, it's, it's, it's all about Jesus. And he's going to destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. What a glorious day that'll be when Satan and the false prophet and all those are cast into the lake of fire forever. They'll never get out of there again. There will never, ever be another rise in rebellion against the people of God, against God himself. And we just got to decide who we want to stand for.